Our next speaker is Philip L. Barlow from Utah State University, who will be talking about Mormon hermeneutics of Luke. He is the Leonard J. Arrington Professor of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University and is the director of the Religious Studies Program there. His teaching centers on religion and human suffering, religion and the concept of time, American religious history and Mormonism. His updated edition of Mormons in the Bible, published by Oxford University Press in 2013, reflects his interest in the Bible's function in American culture and in scripture more broadly. He and his wife, Deborah, are the parents of six children. And following his response, um, Kent Brown will get up and give a response to this morning's papers. So we'll look forward to that, and then we'll end at 12, um, excuse me, yes, at 12.30. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to uh, be down here on the beautiful BYU campus. I um, love it down here, and since it's against my personal religion to covet, I do whatever the baptized form of coveting is about your mountain range, your section of our Wasatch frontier. Um, I'd like to congratulate the... Um, movers and shakers behind this commentary um, series, this incipient series that we're seeing the first fruits of, it is needed. And um, you are to be congratulated for being interested in being here, I think. Uh, I would say there's an awful lot of people who would not recognize why it is needed. Um, it would seem esoteric and scholarly, and I'm glad people with thick glasses and sharp pencils and computers are out doing that, but we've got prophets, and there is a God, and that's all we need, and that's true in a certain sense, but I hope you've recognized um, in your lives on other fronts and here this morning by listening to the speakers that there's a good deal at stake in these conversations. Not everybody needs to be intimately involved in those um, difficulties and challenges and interpretations, but some people do. There's a lot at stake. This new series is ambitious. As you know, it includes a fresh translation or a new rendition, as um, the authors are calling it, of the scriptural texts, and that alone is a big step. Professor Brown's volume and the project as a whole, I anticipate, interacts with current critical editions of the Greek text, and it does interact with some mainstream biblical scholarship, and that is important. It will expose more Latter-day Saints to more information on the Bible and on Scripture from outside our faith traditions. I'll say our, meaning I assume that many or most of you are Latter-day Saints. I'd like to congratulate Professor Brown in particular. Um, he is something of a pioneer Latter-day Saint who's equipped at the Ph.D. level from Brown University, no less, uh, in New Testament studies. And um, there's in his wake um, a... I'm not sure I'd call it a critical mass yet, but a rising um, group of LDS scholars who are expert at that level, who um, naturally will have to be in dialogue with Kent Brown's work um, for the foreseeable future in some ways. His book is clear and lean. Its organization is approachable and user-friendly. The writing, the prose is lucid and lean and readable, and um, one doesn't take that for granted when one is um, trying to absorb smart, elect, fancy scholars of Scripture. Uh, this achievement of simplicity, achievement of lucidity, um, despite the scholarly uh, layers, baklava layers of thinking and work and languages behind it is uh, something we should be grateful for. It will be user-friendly. 
to a general audience and its inclusion of Mormon scriptures and modern revelation will in general be welcomed by the Latter-day Saints. Any number of fine insights and fresh angles of vision we could take into account that Kenda's offered us, but um, since our conference is tightly packed and um, I only have maybe another 15 minutes or so to visit with you, I'd like to, I'd like to set that baseline, that groundwork to say this is a welcome development, a valuable resource, the series as a whole that's forthcoming is important, and we are to be grateful for those who have taken not only years in the writing of these volumes, but um, the years before that, a lifetime in some um, cases before that of of giving one's life over to the preparation and scholarship that it requires to do this sort of work. Um, but I would like to take a few minutes and suggest that there are dangers inherent in a project like this. So that is not to criticize the project as um, a mistake, but it is to point out that there are inherent dangers to a project like this. I don't want to be a sourpuss, but it's a little bit like the Willie and Martin Company needed people to be sourpusses and say, maybe not, um, on planning. Or we're in the middle of um, what may be a historic, and some many scientists are arguing, um, irreversible threat to our planet Earth that God called good. and um, they can be tiresome to many ears, but it may be important to point out um, dangers. Among the dangers of a project like this for a Latter-day Saint commentary, I'm going to take time to mention three. The first is that there is a faith challenge, as most of you would know, out and abroad in the land. Um, it's acute enough that it might not be an exaggeration to call it a faith crisis. This is happening broadly across many religions in the world, not just um, Christianity. When I have my students come from India or Pakistan or um, various parts of the globe, many of them um, uh, of this generation are distancing themselves from their parents' religions. Um, it is broadly the case in Christianity in many parts of the globe. As you probably know, the great cathedrals of Europe, um, Christian cathedrals of Europe, are largely museum pieces today. In the case of the Latter-day Saints, some part of this religious crisis entails coming to terms with our own history which we have done only erratically and with an uneven quality. And the people who are challenged or come upon historical difficulties, very commonly, it is, um, it is part of what defines the crisis, very frequently um, experience a sense of betrayal. Why wasn't I told this? I honor the scholars, the historians, and the church leaders who have and are attempting to respond in such constructive ways as are currently afoot. Some measure of the crisis, however, even now, and more of it in the future, I anticipate, will entail a grapple not only with history and with controversial social policies, but with scripture. In the uh, there's a long history of this of, uh, across the centuries, but at the end of the 19th century and beginning decades of the 20th century, um, virtually every Protestant denomination in the land, and certainly there were strong tensions in Roman Catholicism as well, underwent um, a series of heresy trials and traumas. Um, probably the toughest time for Christianity since the Reformation as far as a tearing of the fabric of 
of the Christian denominations who were broadly divided into fundamentalist and conservative and liberal and modernist um, camps. If we do this new necessary scriptural scholarship, New Testament scholarship, poorly, or merely to tamp down questions, or merely to spruce up faith without addressing the difficulties um, at hand, we are apt to reap a reward in the future of a deepening and ongoing, or perhaps a new, faith crisis, fertilizing a sense of betrayal among um, people mostly of goodwill who are seeking grounds for faith. The second risk I'd like to suggest is that of being too in-house. This is a BYU com New Testament commentary, and the risk I'm suggesting is that we Mormons may only want to hear what we want to hear. We want a commentary for the Latter-day Saints, of course, that um, honors um, Latter-day Saint faith, um, respects modern revelation, and the church as a whole. Um, and that is well and good. I share that desire personally. But if we are not careful, our scholarship may become intellectually incestuous. We do not marry our siblings or our cousins for very good reasons. And that is that the offspring are endangered thereby. Um, that can happen with thought, too. It can happen to presidents of universities or emperors of kingdoms who only hear what they want to hear, and they're surrounded um, by people who tell them what they want to hear, no matter how well-intentioned. That's a difficult thing. So this is a BYU commentary. Um, is the editorial board, I recognize most of the names there, but not all, is the editorial board strictly in-house? Has there been a review process that is rigorous before publication by voices outside of BYU and perhaps outside of the church scholarship outside? Um, I hope that the answer to that is yes. I, I um, haven't talked to those who are fostering this, but I hope that the answer is that because the risk is um, real. And the third danger um, that I'll draw our attention to is what I call the problem of Job's friends. Uh, that is, um, most of us say we love scripture, um, and my grandmother used to say um, of somebody who is being patient, she has the patience of Job, but those sort of comments are for people who haven't read the book of Job. Uh, <laughs> For um, for 38 or so of those chapters in Job, uh, the story is about Job not being patient. I'm not to criticize Job. I might have a little bit of grimacing myself if I went through what is described there. But um, patience, it is not. The point of the book is about something else and contesting with God, more or less. Job's friends, as opposed to Job, who complains almost to the point of de facto accusation, and that's part of why God calls him down for the three long chapters, the longest passage where God is portrayed as speaking anywhere in the Bible, um, in verses uh, 38 and following. Um, as um, distinct from that, Job's friends spend the entire bulk of the book defending God. They don't complain, they just defend God. And at the end of the story, God is very displeased with them. I, God, won't even talk to your friends, Job, except through you, for they have not done well as you have done. It is possible, according to this story, to displease God by defending God on illicit grounds or presumptuous grounds um, that we understand more than we may. I was assigned a topic, or um, Jack, was that you? Um, popped behind my name, a Mormon hermeneutics of Luke. 
hermeneutics, um, I suppose by this time of the morning you have um, a grip on, but it's a funny word. I try to um, spare my students any more than necessary technical words, but it's a technical word that is used as a shorthand for those of you who aren't specialists. You've put up with a lot this morning already um, in encountering stuff that is um, can get complex and technical and in some respects necessarily so. But hermeneutics is not a synonym for interpretation, but rather it as I'm using the word, alludes to the principles of interpretation beneath any particular interpretation. That is, if you and I are justices on the Supreme Court, we may agree on how a case should be settled, or we may disagree, but we also, in either case, may have a different hermeneutic of the Constitution. I may believe that the federal government um, only has powers enumerated in the Constitution, and you may believe that the federal government can do whatever it wants except for those things forbidden by the Constitution. Or I may believe that the Constitution is tantamount to Scripture, excuse me, and shouldn't be touched and is there in concrete for all time. And you might believe that the Constitution is an organic thing that naturally needs to grow with the evolutions of history and society. So it's that sort of thing. What sort of um, principles of interpretation are behind our tr interpretations? A Mormon hermeneutic applied to the Gospel of Luke will naturally be influenced by a more basic cultural set of understandings um, that could be applied to Scripture more broadly. Some of these are rather lovely from the perspective of someone like me who is a believer. There is a God, for instance, and that belief may affect how one approaches Scripture. There is such a phenomenon as humans receiving inspiration and even revelation from God. But some notions informing assumptions about Scripture, and I say assumptions because most people don't have a developed conscious hermeneutic, conscious series of principles of interpretation, but rather assumptions. Some of these notions are problematic. For instance, some Mormons seem to believe that because there is such a thing as revelation, therefore we've got things right. But the Bible's a very messy thing, sort of like human life, with struggles and errors, and it's a collection of very different sorts of um, people and human responses, and uh, much of it, much of it in uh, in the Hebrew Bible entails wrestling with what mess-ups the Hebrew people are that um, Israel is. Um, Joseph Smith um, changed attitude and took away from revelations. Um, you've heard analogous points made, and Julie in particular was meditating in a detailed way about that. Um, the fact if our faith is true, the fact that there's such a thing as revelation um, that's authentic um, does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that we've got things right. As Julie pointed out, um, all sorts of prophetic figures have interacted with texts and um, amended, um, allegedly improved them. Another example is the notion that because we've received revelation, because we've received a commission and a task to carry out, and because we believe we've received authority to pursue that task, we therefore do not need to learn much concerning religion from other people. But one, that's a bit of a problem of a very basic gospel perspective, namely humility. Um, Stephen Webb, who um, spoke to us earlier and who um, will give an independent lecture tomorrow or discussion of his book, What Other Christians uh, Might Learn from the Latter-day Saints, um, is widely celebrated among Mormon scholars for writing a courageous and imaginative, brilliant actually in many ways, book exploring that. But are we Latter-day Saints prepared to return the favor? Might we be interested in what Roman Catholics like Stephen Webb could teach us Latter-day Saints? 
Secondly, the problem that we don't, the problem of the assumption that we don't have much to learn concerning religion from others because of the restoration uh, runs directly contrary to the 13th article of faith, which um, declares and implicitly instructs Latter-day Saints to pursue um, the good, the true, the beautiful, the virtuous, and the praiseworthy, whatever its source. How will these thoughts apply to the forthcoming New Testament commentary? If Professor Brown's commentary is a representative foreshadowing, he has engaged other scholarship, and this is most welcome. But the commentary on Luke will presumably um, spark discussion about the extent of this engagement. For instance, my friends who are expert on the New Testament, I'm a historian of American religion and think about other things, but I do think about the history of the use of the Bible in American religious history. But those who are genuinely experts in the New Testament as such, some of whom are LDS, tell me that there are works, even works just in English, that are so central to current scholarship about Luke as to be widely considered essential research commentaries. One example is John Nolan's three-volume treatment of Luke as part of the word biblical commentary. Even more widely recognized in the field is Francois Bovan's three-volume commentary on Luke published during the last decade by Fortress Press. I could find no engagement of these particular works in Kent's volume, and there may be um, perfectly good reasons for that, perfectly defensible reasons for the choice. Heaven knows that I have been um, criticized by some scholars for writing a book that some or another reviewer wanted me to write rather than the one I set out to write. But no matter the reasons, the result of not engaging, not engaging such central figures um, is not without consequence. It, it will um, affect the nature of the commentary inevitably, uh, for good or ill. Also, have our volumes invited, uh, I guess I already made that point, supportive critical review by scholars outside of LDS circles and by LDS scholars who are outside of BYU. Now, the eighth article of faith presents us with a sort of a hermeneutic. How shall we interpret scripture? We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. The difficulty with that hermeneutic is it requires a hermeneutic to think about it. Uh, what does it mean? Um, Joseph Smith, um, as most of you will know, once suggested that men, humankind, were co-equal with God. And B.H. Roberts um, said, that's a little dicey. What the prophet meant to say with that statement is that um, human beings, intelligence, and spirits are co-eternal with God. Um, and the church seems um, broadly to accept that interpretation. Um, if that's true, what, what did Joseph mean by any number of his words? Like scripture, whether it's canonized or not, that requires some very careful thought. Um, we, we believe the Bible to be the word of God if there's not a translation issue um, or, or problem, what does that mean? Does it mean that if we are faithful to Scripture, we must interpret the Tower of Babel as the source of all diversity in human language? I'm, I'm out of time. Ha. Well, there are issues. I will say four more sentences just to say goodbye to you. Um, what does it mean to, does, did Joseph mean to say the Bible, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as translated correctly, but he himself um, pointed to all manner of problems that weren't just matters of translation. Um, scribes added this, or wicked people took this out, or the sort of things that Lincoln was talking about were going on all through the centuries. Um, so did Joseph really mean we believe the Bible be the word of God as far as it is transmissed, transmissed correctly? Did he mean the Bible contains 
the word of God or conveys the word of God? Does history convey the word of God? Does Christ incarnate convey the word of God? All these things can be um, very challenging. But um, there's more to say. Um, in short, um, I'm very glad for this commentary. I'm glad for Kent Brown and his courageous and pioneering work and others who are involved in this um, great project. But I do think we need to be wary since it's possible to think we do God's service um, and defend God on problematic grounds that don't necessarily follow. And again, that's not an accusation. That's just the sort of questions I'd be asking myself if I were part of this project team and trying to produce this um, valuable commentary. Thank you. Thank you.